Hello everyone. Welcome to the Bug Bounty second session here at Cal State University Fullerton Offensive Security Society Club. Our first session was basically explaining what Bug Bounty is, what we're going to do. So if you haven't watched that, I highly recommend doing so, which will because it will make it easy for you to transition throughout all the videos. You know, most of our videos correlate uh, correlate one through another. So it's good to constantly follow these things, watch these videos. For today, is we're going to cover about insecure direct object reference vulnerability. Um, in short form, it's called IDOR, I-D-O-R. And it is one of the most common found vulnerabilities and one of the most easily found vulnerabilities because it's really easy to detect. And you can easily see if it's a vulnerability or not, or you can easily see if you found this or not when, t when testing whether to black box or white box. Uh, this is our first video about covering a bug or a vulnerability, so I will go through how our template looks like. So this is how our usual template for each vulnerability will look like. There might be slight changes, but for this one specifically, this is what we're going to do. For most of them, we will follow the same template. As I said, there will be some changes. It depends on the vulnerability too. So for this one, we're going to start out with defining what IDOR is. We're going to you know, kind of visualize and that's number one says so create a diagram of how, how IDOR looks like. So instead of just directly diving into the technical aspect of what IDOR is, we'll use a graph idea to see how it works, how it looks like and uh, such like that, right? So with defining, we'll go over the um, exact definition that OWASP uh, has about IDOR. Um, you can check out OWASP page. I'll also have it linked on the description of this video. It has for it has definitions and examples for all vulnerabilities out there, and we will look into the uh, black box part of IDOR where you are, where you are not given the source code of an application, where you basically have Firefox or whatever in whatever browser you are using, or if you're using a mobile app for testing API endpoints, you have those basically what a user will see, and you are intercepting the request through any kind of medium like Postman. Uh, with Postman, you usually just forward the request, but other than that, like main tool that we use is Burp Suite. So if you are uh, if you are looking through Burp and if you're going through the black box testing, that's what we're going to cover for number three. The third part, the fourth part is source code analysis to find what an IDOR bug is. So the part, the interesting thing, or not interesting, the important thing is to understand that you'll always not be in a scenario of uh, black box testing, right? You will be in a scene where you are given a source code and you are asked to identify that. Uh, one example is if you go on a security engineer interview and if you're on a technical interview on site, you will have some coding challenges as well as you might be given a piece of code and you know you might be asked to identify the vulnerabilities in this code. So that's why for every vulnerability we cover, I'll try to add the source code analysis part to it. That way when you see a piece of code on your interview, wherever you go, like whenever you're asked to find those, you can easily identify that. Yes, the programming language will differ. Some company might show you a PHP, some will show you Python, you know, Flask, some will show you Node.js, or some might show you like other languages, right? But the concept will always be the same. And if you're able to identify the concept within the code, it will always help you, help you to identify these vulnerabilities. And we're also gonna go over uh, examples of IDOR in real life. So I will show examples of some bug bounty reports that have come up. There are tons of them outside there. I just picked some of them that are easy to go through, that are easy to explain. So you can always look up IDOR bug bounty write-up or something, and you will be able to see the explanation. You'll be able to see write-ups on this kind of uh, vulnerability types. So let's get started with the definition. So this is the exact definition from OWASP. I've highlighted some important aspect of it that I think is important for us to understand. So I'm just gonna shorten this out IDOR occur when an application provides direct access to objects based on user supplied in input. So let's kind of you know decode that per se. So when it says direct access to objects based on user supplied input, it means that basically let's say you have some kind of a user object, whether it's email, personal name, identification and stuff like you know credit card details, SSN, or basic info, or it can be you know the data of like how much a company has used this API or anything like that. And it basically shows you those objects, it basically gives you info about those objects just based on your input. 
So it doesn't do any form of checks whether you have permission to access those and it will just give you that detail. So one example will be, we'll go through that on the diagram is if as a user you say, I don't want to see my detail, let me see someone else's detail, you know, show me someone else's detail and the website will not care who you are or your permission level and it will just give you access to those. And uh, based on the type of access you get, some of the vulnerability even in iDoor might be low severity, but some might be extremely critical. So it always depends on the level of access you get, what you can do with this bug, et cetera. And as it says, you know, as this, as this definition says, as a result of this vulnerability, attackers can bypass authorization and access resources in the system directly. For example, database records or files. So just to clarify on that, there's different way you'll be able to access database record or files. Um, you know, if you have other bugs like SQL index and RC, you are getting access to more in-depth database or files. With IDOR, you basically get access to stuff like, um, you know, basically query to the database. So, for example, if a website, this is one of the most common occurrences, when you go to edit your profile or something like that, or when you want to view your profile, a user call is made that says, show me user ID 196, 193, 195, whatever your user ID is, and you can basically query through that so you can enumerate through all this number of IDs and get other users' info. Sometimes it could be an expected behavior, especially if the website allows you to access the public info, but if there's sensitive info that you can access, which includes SSN, credit card number, as I said before, or you know, in terms of files, let's say one of the vital examples is if you are interested in cryptocurrency, you'll be able to see these kind of examples. Most of uh, currency trading website will require you to verify your IDs or to you know, uploading your pictures, uploading your password number, anything like that. And you can usually, you know, some of the starting companies, they won't check for security issues. So they won't check for this kind of uh, access controls. And you can basically query someone else's file and see those details. So that's what it usually means by accessing someone else's file. Now, moving on to after all the definition type, uh, we'll move on directly to visualizing items. So I have a quick example we can use for that. Let me quickly reshare the screen directly to what we need to see. And share that. So this is uh, how you can map out what an IDOR is. So when we visualize IDOR, this is what you'll be able to kind of see in real life. So in this case, we have the main website here that contains two users' data, user A and user B. So I'm gonna quickly modify this and add one more info. Let's say user A's data you know, ID is 196, and user B's ID is 193, right? So we have two different user, and as you can see, here's a relationship between these accounts. So user A and user B are not related no matter what, but user E says, give me user A data, which is my own data, and the website will gladly you know, give it back. So let me do a relationship back to user A, right? So we have back and forth. So user A can request it, user uh, user A can request to the website and website will give it back. And the same thing happens with user B. So you can basically query back and forth. But what happens with an interesting part is when a website is vulnerable to IDOR, user A will say, I don't want ID 196, give me ID 193. So it will send this you know, query to the website requesting 193's ID and the website won't check for it. So the website will say, all right, here you go. And it will just give it back to you. So as user A or as an attacker, you can change the ID, you can get user B's info. Similarly, user B will say, you know, if they are an attacker, they will say, I don't want to see 193, I want to see 196. So they'll request that to the website and the website will say, uh, why not? You know, you get access to that. Let me delete this right now. So we're focusing more on our tax scenario here. So in this case, you can see there's a cross request, right? So user A is saying, I want user B's, the website gives that, and user B says, I want user A. So that's how an IDO will really look like. Like if we kind of try to visualize, this is how it usually goes as. There's different other scenarios, you know, with files, with uh, user information. There's different uh, part of a website you'll find these vulnerabilities in but most of them is basically the same idea, the same concept. And what the websites will really do, so if you are a developer, you're trying to protect 
the website from being vulnerable to this is let's say user A, um, I'm gonna move this here. So, so to make it easier. So let's say user A says, you know, give me user B's data. The website will not reply back. Instead, it will kind of throw an error. So it will say, let me add. So the user will instead make a kind of a relationship. Well, let's not go say relationship, but it basically links that and says to the user A that it tries to request that and it gets access denied. So it will send that to user A. So when user B here tries to send a request to the website for user B's data, it will check, see if there's a permission. If not, give it a four and give it a four three access denied, and it replies back to user A saying you cannot do it. And it does exactly the same thing. So it will not be a back and forth relationship. It will not, you know, it will not have. It will not just give it right away. It will do some kind of a permission check. So here also we have a permission check, right? Uh, so basically, if it doesn't have a permission, return four or three, and it basically has that check. So when user B requests data to user A, the request is sent and it checks for the permission, and if it fails, it replies. So there has to be a check in the middle, no matter what. So a good access control needs to be present on this kind of a website. Anything you do where a user can request someone else's data, where they can where they can request their own data through API, through website, through file uploads, any of those scenarios, it's extremely good to, you know, it's extremely encouraged and it is required that you have access control. When you don't, you end up with an idle vulnerability. So once we have covered this, we're gonna move now into the part of seeing it through a black box person. So we're going to use ctf.hacker101.com. I think we did cover that on the first video. Uh, it's basically a CTF that Hacker One has with different vulnerabilities, one of them being IDO. So we'll cover that real quick and then we'll move into source code analysis. Let's share that. Let me do a screen share because we're going to need to see two different windows for this. So, here we have a page um, in the Hacker One City of it's a micro CMS. So, you can create a new page, you can edit a new page, right? So, you can see the testing page that were created and you can edit those. One interesting thing you'll notice when you do that is you'll see, you know, when you request like random. Of those some of those don't exist and there will be some that will say you know you don't like for example here it gives you permission to access this directly and the reason it says my secret flag is if you go to this so let's go back to this i kind of jumped the gun here. so if you go to you know you can enumerate through pages here you can see different test pages so it's markdown test now we go to three it doesn't exist we go to four that doesn't exist five doesn't exist six and you can see it says you are not allowed to view this so it kind of shows that there's some kind of uh, access control here it tells you that you cannot see this page you are not allowed to you don't have the permission to do so but as we saw i kind of jumped the gun already is when we go to edit the page it's not checking that right so when we just view the page it checks it but when i go to six directly it does not check so it says private page and here's my flag because this is a ctf so this is a real quick example. Now, why do I involve Burp Suite on this is, let's say you want to kind of automate this, you know, see what you have access to, you can easily intercept. So you'll be able to see the requisite mix and send that to repeater. So here you have, now you can either play with the repeater doing the same thing. So you can do two, you know, go, three, go, and then you can see the request or you can send this to intruder. So we will have a burp session video soon, but this is basically a general idea of what Intruder does. With Intruder, you can brute force, you can request you know, various data quickly, so you, you can basically enumerate through those, you can automate all this. Instead of manually typing the ID, instead of manually going to the pages, you can basically automate. So in this case, we want to target the ID, right? So we will select that. 
and this that means this is where my payloads where all my targets so be hitting so we go to payloads and we say let's uh, enumerate numbers because in this case we have numbers that are going sequentially and I want to do one to ten right just to see how it goes and I'm just gonna slow it down a little bit so that we can see so we do a start attack and we'll see it's hitting all these pages and we can see the errors that's coming through it so there's one two three four all of them are returning 404s and as we see here we will see the status code which means how the words are responded uh, when it says 200 the words are responded fine when it says 404 that means there was nothing there the page did the page did not exist aka not found but we see one interesting one out of all of this is 403 which is forbidden so that means you are not allowed to access now in the same way we can you know now we know that there's a permission check on doing the page and we're not allowed to see page number six or blog or post number six. Now we go to edit and we intercept that request. And we can do the same thing, you know, go to repeater, go one by one through all of these, right? So we can just keep going like that or we can send this to intruder. And we can do the same exact thing. So what you can do is go to positions and edit the ID and click add to that. So in this case, the ID of the block is a numerical, which is like three, one, two, four, six, right? So, and we can do the same request here with numerical format. So one to 10, you know, go through that and just see how it works, right? So in this case, I just did it real quick. You can see a lot of them return 404, but ID six returns 200. Now, when we compare that to the previous one that we saw, which is forbidden, it kind of tells us that there was access control on seeing the page, but there was no control in editing. And that's something you'll see common. Some websites might protect you from and you know, prevent you from seeing someone else's profile. But if you change the ID, they can easily, you, know, you can easily see or modify someone's info. So in this case, just changing the ID to six will give us access to the so-called private page they had. So in a, in a usual scenario, when in idle, when you know there's some kind of access control or when there's not, the best way to do it is just change the ID. You can do intruder, like for example, to find if there's some kind of access control, or you can just use repeater. Repeater is the easiest way to do it because you can just send one ID and see how it interacts. So in this case, because this was a CT of that couple of pages that did not exist, and then you have one page in the middle that existed that you did not have access to. In real life, you can kind of see some ideas will go numerical. If you don't have numerical going IDs, let's say if they're skipping every two, if they're skipping every three, you can easily you know, see the patterns and then modify. So one example, in this case, as you saw, we have, we compared the results, right? So for example, when you go to a page you exist, page that you have access to, it shows you the page. When you don't go to a page that exists, it shows you this. So one thing I, frequently recommend people to do is if you're testing a website that has modifying user information changing user details i recommend them to uh, kind of you know, create two accounts so if you have two different accounts with two different ids you basically make one account a victim and one an attacker and modify their infos as necessary so that's the black box part right here, we have no idea what the code is. We have no idea how the website looks like in the back end. We just see the front end and we are testing it based on that. So how does IDRO look like in some ways when we look at a source code? So we're gonna quickly jump back to our presentation. So let me pull that up. So we go, we already did testing IDRO. So now we're gonna do a source code example. Um, let me load that. So here's the source code, but in the video when you're seeing this presentation it might be hard to see it so i also have a link so we're going to visit that and here we have the exact link exact code that we want to analyze now if you go through this page we have a bunch of lines of code so just to go over what this is this is a vulnerable web app that i wrote about seven months ago when we were going over bug bounty last semester uh, so this has tons of vulnerabilities, but I just wanted to cover IDOR on this one. So I selected the specific code that has the vulnerability. So we're going to go through the code, not line by line, because there are some things that we don't need to worry about. 
that I'm going to kind of, you know, go through the code to explain what it's doing. So if we check at first, the route for this is send. So you are allowed to either send a get or a post request, meaning you can fetch the website as well as you can send some data to the website. And we can see the function name because this is in Python is send money. So pirate is a fake bank application. So one crucial part of a bank app is sending money, right? So we have a send money function, a send money, send money web UI uh, virtually. I don't have the UI here right now, but this is a code. And it says there's a form called send money. So there's some details that the user is going to input. And there's three specific things that the user is inputting. So receiver ID, which in this case will be the ID of the person that's receiving the money. So, you know, in bank, uh, thing, in, when you're doing bank transactions online, that's if you want to send someone money to a different bank account, you put the bank ID. And then you put the transfer amount. And here's another part that's called sender ID. So in this case, think it like the sender's transaction ID, right? The person who is sending this ID. So, or not transaction ID, like the account ID. So for example, if I'm sending money to a user X, it will be my account ID as sender ID and user X money account as receiver ID. So when we see the code, it says check if the sender can send money. So it checks if you know, it gets the user info so user the query the get sender ID. So the code might look complex. Basically, so let me explain what it is because it might look complex, as I said. Um, so it basically says user is the database query function, and it says get me every info about the user based on this ID, right? And then it sends that query, and then it checks if the transfer amount, meaning how much the user is sending, is greater than the balance. Then say you know you do not have enough balance, but if they have less, if the transfer moment is less than the balance, then go ahead and add balance to the receiver's ID. So basically add money to the receiving person's account and remove money from the sender's account. And then just return saying a money transfer worked. But if you check the code, you will analyze that there's something wrong with this code. It's not checking if the user has access to sending the money. So for example, it just says send query, get the user info. It doesn't check if the current user ID is the same as the sender ID. So what you can do with this is you can basically flip this ID. So you'll put your victim's ID here and your ID on the receiver ID. And basically when you supply that, so you know what you'll do in real life attack is you'll put your account info on the receiver's ID place. So wherever the forms is so many receivers and you'll add the victim's account on the request where he sends the sender ID. And what that does is the website will say, all right, you know, the victim has you know, balance, so let's transfer the money. And we get, as an attacker, we get the money and victim will lose the money. So that's a real basic example right here. There are other vulnerabilities or another IDO in this code, but I'll leave for you to figure that out. So if you go on this specific uh, link, I'll post that in the description. Um, also on the PowerPoint, you'll see some other functions that are vulnerable to IDOR. And if you can figure that out, great for you, because you, know, you kind of understand. At that point, you understand what the vulnerability is and how to analyze that on the code. So a quick recap on how you find this uh, code. If you see any part of a code where it's doing some sensitive action, modifying profile information, accessing sensitive information, you know, sending something, changing something, and you notice it's not checking the current ID matches the ID that the user is inputting, then you have a 99% chance of ID, right? If you're not checking if the current logged in user, whoever is sending the request, has the same ID as the person, you know, as the ID on that input request that they are sending, if you are accepting some kind of an ID from the input, then you have a vulnerability. Most of the companies will kind of fix this by basically not passing any ID. Let's say you know, it's like modifying profile, they won't pass profile ID. Instead, they'll just grab the current session user's ID and then just modify this and that. So that's one way you can secure. In this case, the other way of securing is checking if the sender ID is equals to current ID. If it does, then process. If not, let them know that they cannot access it. So that's the source code analysis portion of this.
So let's go back and move on. So this is the recap of where you'll find bugs like I do. So you'll find idols in most of the common places is modifying profile info. So if you might have noticed throughout this video, I've been focused on editing infos, editing emails, editing names, right? And accessing different cards of users. So in a, if you're checking shopping sites, you might be able to access someone else's shopping cart. And in those cases, you can access billing infos, um, shipping details, and data like such. And sometimes you can delete objects. So you know, if you are if you see a request where you can delete your cart, where you can delete your account, where you can delete a website you have made if it's some kind of CMS related site, and if you realize you can change the ID, and, and there will be a chance you know, when you realize that that if you create a second account and test it, you will be able to modify or delete someone else's info, delete someone else's sites, cards, whatever you're deleting. Another thing is accessing information right so it doesn't necessarily have to be profile info you can access files you can access documents they uploaded as i gave an earlier example with cryptocurrency websites when you upload your verification id if you you know when you try to see the id or when you try to modify the id you might be able to get someone else's id you might be able to replace someone else's id so we'll cover that part in one of the bug bounty examples too so let's move on to that so now we have three reports that I picked. Uh, I'm gonna start with the Google Hangout chat IDOR. So this was found by someone. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be their name, so I cannot credit them directly, but it's on a website called Secretly, Secretly Hidden Write-ups in Blogspot. So someone wrote a blog on what they found on Google G Suite Hangout chat. So this is basically a feature that Google introduced where companies have basically a Slack within Google, so it's like a messaging thing for companies, employees doing a message each other and stuff. And what they noticed here is, let me show you the request so we can go. And this is something you'll see with Burp, right? Now here are a couple of things that you'll see interesting. So there's a post request meaning it's sending some data and there's, you know, user says and cookie and you know, client data, content, type, the user is in the basic thing of the website. But here is the main request. So if you see that it's sending after REQ and you will see there are a couple of things that this is sending. One really interesting part is the two things that this uh, blogger wrote about. So one, this ID, and there's another one. So there's, and as they explain, you know, there's two different significance of this ID versus this. So when we check 1151 on this request, it turns out it's the ID of the actual bot. So in this case, what happens is in G Suite, you can add bots to your account or to your chat so that they can send auto messages, right? Like for example, if there's a change in your account, if something happens, if, you, if it gets a new news, if it gets, you know, let's say in this case, if you get a grade or something, it will send you an automated message. So that's the ID of the bot. The second in this case is the space. So it's the space and then it has this ID, if you notice here, right? So what this was was the ID of the chat room. So wherever your chat room was, like whenever you're chatting, top bar, you'll see the ID, and it was the ID of the chat room. So what this um, hacker, what this you know researcher decided to do was have the same block of bot's ID, but change the chat room ID to another organization chat room. So let's say you're organization A, and there's organization B you want to attack. So what will happen is you'll change the ID to a chat room of organization B and your bot will automatically get added to their account. So what that will allow you to do is send any message you want to someone else's chat, someone other organized. So it doesn't even have to be your company. As a company A, you will be able to attack company B. So that's another part of this vulnerability. So that's like a classic example of I you know, and it can be dangerous. So in this case, he was able to just so far, it seems like, you could edit, delete, or add your own webhooks, but in other cases, you could probably see the message contents, right? If you're able to pull info off the chat, if you're able to pull who is on the chat, you know, what's the name of the chat, or what kind of attacks, and there are various attacks you might be able to do. In this case, it was limited to just adding the webhook, so it kind of limits the scenario. That's one reason why it was paid 5K. So let me explain like how severely might work on this. So here he has already a bug where he's able to bypass the control that was in place if there was any. 
But at the same time, he's able to just send messages. Like he was able to read, modify messages that were sent already within the chat. That will have lead to a breach of privacy. That will have lead to a massive breach of security, which could have lead to you know 10k, 13k bounties because that will be a high security. This one is a medium one usually because there's not much you can do except sending your own message, right? And the company can use all just delete your bot. But if you can create something, you know, a bot that can listen to messages, if that was a functionality that Google had, then that will be something you, know, you don't even have to post a message. You can silently to see every single message that was being sent. So that's one classic example. Um, let's move on to this report from HackerOne. So this one was sent to a company named Maximo, which does employee branding and recruitment, and it's sent by a hacker named Kieran Crescens. I don't know if I pronounced it right, if I probably butchered it, I'm sorry. But here, you can see in the title, it says Idle Editing Courses. So if we go here, he kind of gives a proof of concept, and he tells you like where the vulnerability is. So he says, create an account, go to this website, and then intercept the request. So by intercept, he means it's something like Burp Suite. And you can see that when you add a course, a post request is made. And in that case, it's a number. So basically like what we have seen in our examples, the number in something that's numerical, something, in, well, number numerical anyway, but something that you can increment, right? So there's a pattern where it's either plus one or it could skip. And you can easily see the pattern and then attack. And he says like, go to the other account. So that's what I have previously requested or you know kind of give you guys advice is when you're testing for idle in a company create at least two accounts that way you can see what's going on and you can also verify if what you changed actually worked because if you're attacking someone else's account you are not only violating the company's policy when you're testing them you're also you also have no clue if that worked so I usually recommend just creating a second account testing against it because then you're not violating you're basically testing your own account you're attacking your own account and the same time you'll actually be able to see the results so you will exactly know that there's vulnerability there and in this case he was able to edit the course change the id and basically in in theory you know in real life he was able to modify someone else's course info so here's the post request you saw so as you can see there's an id here right and it's similar to what we saw with uh the CT of that, so except that it was in the URL, in this case it's a post request, so it has this ID. So you'll just modify it, and then it will let you know if that worked, right? So if it's actually valid, it will give you a valid info, and you can easily exploit this. So there's multiple different attacks you could do. They reported this and got paid for it. Another example is a report that I sent. So let me quickly cover this. This is a different scenario. That you'll see so this is not like your typical ID where you change the ID so let me explain this in a more in depth so what happens is Shopify a e-commerce site recently released about well not recently but like seven eight months ago they released a app called Shopify exchange basically you can create your store an online store online presence and you can sell that to someone else you know once your store gets popular if you want to sell it you can sell it so you can digitally sell a store and that was really cool feature that they had. So while I, what I noticed was, let's say a bidder comes to me as someone, a buyer for the site, right? And they say, I want to buy your site through a message. And I'll say, all right, sounds good. You know, send me some info, send me what your plan is. Or they ask me to send me some of your internal store info. And I say, all right. And I attach the file. They were basically, when you upload the file, they were not changing the file name. So what happens is whatever the file name was, they will basically go on this website so they were hosting is on another directory on amazon they were storing it there and they'll put your file in here so what the risk here was is let's say you already know a file that existed you could directly browse to the website or browse to that file and it was not doing any form of access control and i believe i also told about it here so here as you can see i said now, I was just randomly checking, I ended up finding escrow.png and I was able to browse it. So that will contain some sensitive info of another store's escrow process, right? And not only that I was able to access someone else's file without any kind of access control, I was also able to replace that file. So what will happen is when I upload a file, I could basically say my file name is escrow.png and it will replace that file. So I could have 
my content displayed there. And in an attacker way, what you could do with that is you could basically modify someone else's file and then when they go view it, you know, it will not be the same file they saw. So that was one really easy attack you could do. And in this case, it's not like you're changing the ID or you're seeing how the file upload functionality works. So file upload is also one thing commonly vulnerable to ID, but it's more related to replacing files. You'll not be able to view someone else's files. Uh, in this case, I got lucky that it did not have a security measure on accessing files. But nonetheless, you know, they always check how file upload works. If they are not checking your file name, and if they are not randomly assigning where the file goes. So what could happen is some sites do not change the file name, but randomly assign a random ID, you know, like nine number ID of a numeric before that directory. So the top directory will be just randomly generated and your file will exist there, but then attacking that will be hard, right? But if you can just upload the file right away without changing the name, then you can do it. So that's the basic part of IDO. Um, in future, as we advance on these courses, we will be going through in depth what I do. So there are another attack scenarios where you can bypass access controls, where you can enumerate your accounts and various other attacks. So we will go through those. But that's about it for the bug bounty I do sessions. So let me make sure I covered everything. Uh, yes, we covered examples of I do. We did a source code analysis. We did a black box example. We visualized through the graph and then we also define I do. So that's how most of our sessions will go in terms of going over the vulnerability type. Um, you know, I highly recommend you guys to go sign up on HackerOne, look at, look at some programs and see if you can find an ID on that, right? So that will be a challenge from me. In our next bug bounty session, let's see if some of you can end up finding an ID. If you do, that'll be really awesome to see. So, and once it is fixed, you could definitely share it with the world, share it with our you know, club, or anything like that and we'll be glad to help you share this outside as well uh, outside of the community and also if you want help you know feel free to contact us on contact us in slack and we'll be glad to reach out and reach back help you so that's about it uh, have a great weekend and that's it for today our next meeting is on october 28th and we will be covering sql injection in that one thank you very much have a great day